Welcome to the 2010 Film Industry Mixer Mover and Shaker panel discussion. My name is George Norfleet. I am the director of the uh, Connecticut Office of Film, Television, and Digital Media. I'm very happily employed in that position, and I'm very happy that all of you are somehow also employed in the industry, I'm hoping, and if not right now, soon to be. Enough about me. I'd like to take the, these moments to introduce the gentlemen that are sitting on the panel with me here. Directly to my right, <coughs> excuse me, is Doug McAward. Doug uh, graduated from the New York Institute of Technology uh, in 1979. You wrote that down, so I'm sharing it with everybody. I got the whole thing, brother. Um, Four, four years after uh, Doug graduated, he uh, started his own production company, Macaward Productions, in New York City. In 1988, he moved to Connecticut uh, to take over special effects and studio production company and expanded its roster from a single director to six. Doug has worked as an independent producer and director with a number of blue chip clients in the advertising industry and in 1990 was elected to the Executive Council of the Connecticut Association of Production Professionals which is an industry trade organization here in the state. This led to an 11 year stint as a member of the Connecticut Film Commission and the last eight years of that he spent as the chairman. Um, not too long ago, Doug teamed up with makeup artist Sheila McKenna and developed Ket Cosmetics, which is the first airbrush makeup which is designed specifically for high def cameras. Doug has been the recipient of the gold medal at the Houston Film Festival, the silver medal at the Chicago Film Festival, as well as the Matrix Award, and he is a member of the Directors Guild of America. Doug Mack Award. <laughs> Going in order of those as they are seated concentrically away from me. Next would be Alec Aston. Alec's fascination for captivating stories with moving image for capturing stories with moving images evolved at the age of 10 when he mastered his family's Bell and Howell 8 millimeter camera. He used to entertain kids in the neighborhood by screening some of his epic creations where he would film his friends blowing up model boats, dinosaurs, and probably other things that the, uh, has been sealed. <laughs> Uh, later, he enrolled at the University of Bridgeport's Department of Cinema and Television, where his senior thesis film, Justice, won the Audience Award at the Canadian International Film Festival and the Berlin Film Festival. Following graduation, he was appointed as adjunct faculty there. Uh, in 1995, Alec moved to Mystic, Connecticut, and became staff director and editor at Sonalist Studios. Some of you may be familiar and perhaps even have worked at Sonalists. And in January of 2007, Alec founded Firesight Films and currently has various stories in development whose characters interact with prominent events in history. His goal is to produce quality crafted films that not only entertain family audiences, but inspire them to research historic events. In March of 2008, Alec became one of the founders and is the current president of Southeastern Connecticut Filmmakers, which is also known as Sect Film, an organization that promotes quality filmmaking in Southern New England. Alec Aston. <laughs> Excuse me as I flip around. Senator Gary LeBeau is with us tonight. First elected as a state representative to the Connecticut General Assembly from East Hartford in 1990 and subsequently elected to the state Senate in 1996, Gary LeBeau currently serves as the Senate Chair of the Commerce Committee and member of the Transportation, Finance Review and Bonding and Legislative Management Committees. Senator LeBeau is fortunate to represent a diverse district that includes the great towns of East Hartford, East Windsor, Ellington and South Windsor. He is known for his unflagging devotion to the growth of Connecticut businesses and industries, tax credits for job creation, major investments in biotechnology, stem cell research, and alternative energies such as fuel cells, and linking the research departments of various state institutions of higher learning with startup high technology firms. 
Originally born and raised in East Hampton, Massachusetts, Senator LeBeau is a former public school teacher for 36 years and is now retired. He lives with his wife, Joanne, their three children, Kara, Matthew, and Christopher, and their chocolate Labrador retriever, appropriately named Hershey. <laughs> Senator LeBeau. <laughs> Next, Larry Meistrich. Larry is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and in 1990, at the tender age of 24, with just $7,000, founded the Shooting Gallery, which I used to want to work at a lot when I lived in New York in the industry. Didn't work out for me. <laughs> in his triple role as founder, chairman of the board, and executive officer of the Shooting Gallery, Larry was a hands-on producer and an integral part of the production of roughly 100 films, commercials, and music videos, including the Academy Award winning Sling Blade and the Academy Award nominated You Can Count On Me. He made industry history when Sling Blade was purchased by Miramax for a price that broke all previous sale records in independent film, and I remember that too. I remember that too. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Meistrich. And at the end of the table, I'm not going to say last but not least or anything cliche like that, but we have with us, we're fortunate to have with us Doug Schwab. Doug is the founder and president of Maverick Entertainment and was actually born and raised in New Orleans. He has established himself as one of the leading forces in the world of home video distribution and production. Maverick Entertainment got its start as a leader in the creation, promotion, and distribution of urban and Latino-themed films. With a commitment to the highest standard of home entertainment, Maverick has expanded its distribution to six specialty labels, including Maverick Platinum, Maverick Urban, Maverick Latino, Desire, Creep Effects, and Maverick Spirit. A 31-year veteran of the home video business and with more than 13 years experience as the owner and founder of Maverick Entertainment Group, he has an unmatched ability to recognize what works. In fact, around his circle, he is considered the best at doing so. Doug is a master at putting deals together and excels at positioning the talent and running the show. Today, his contacts and relationships remain part of the, his company's moral fiber. We are lucky, and I am happy to present to you Doug Schwab. How much time do I have left now? Sorry. Here we go. The first question is um, one that I would like to ask of all of the folks that are sitting here um, on the panel, and that is, having been introduced with what I will call a binary code bang with the Y2K scare, what factor or factors do you feel have most impacted the film and digital media industry over the past decade, the first decade of this century? And let's start with... Uh, Doug, on the very end. Can we draw straws to go? <laughs> yeah, but it would take up too much time. If we're talking about the decade now, the most challenging, I don't know if we have enough time to really cover that in this panel, but what I can really uh, tell you from my perspective of being a video distributor, the people have always liked content. People have always wanted content. and. Although there's a lot of doom and gloom in the industry, so to speak, with the brick and mortar businesses dwindling down, uh, as far as Hollywood Video and a handful of other chains leaving, uh, people are worried about Blockbuster's existence into the future. But the future is bright as far as digital delivery goes. There's so many new exciting ways of what will be coming down the pike with iTunes and YouTube and Hulu and Google. And there's so many ways to distribute films that actually filmmakers will have more opportunities than they ever have had in the past. So the most, the, the biggest challenge and, and difference for us is adapting and rolling with technology and uh, technology uh, in, in a quick enough pace to, uh, to keep up, uh, so to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Larry. If it was five years ago, I would have said, you know, look to your right and look to your left and really nobody's going to have an opportunity to make anything that succeeds. Um, what I think the, the digital divide has done is sort of 
break the the system um, open so that you don't frankly need somebody like us who are distributors and sort of already in the club so to speak to to buy your work or to, to promote your work you know you can put up a Facebook page or a YouTube page and start getting the word out there and spend all night marketing your stuff because one thing that people very rarely talk about in this business is marketing um, it's one thing to make a film it's another thing to tell people it exists and it's extremely expensive to tell people it exists it's a very crowded marketplace um, I brought my sons here today they watched a movie on an iTunes iTouch iTouch right on an iTouch in the car they're you know to me I would never do that as a consumer because I'm used to the screen and this freaks me out but um, they're growing up that way, but the movie is competing with the games and interacting with their friends and everything else. So when you sit down to think of what you're going to make, you should be a business person and not just think of what you're going to make and how you're going to make it, but who's going to watch it and how are you going to tell them about it? And I think the internet and technology has created a tremendous amount of opportunities to tell people it exists. And then when you do figure out that question, to make a smart decision on how much you're going to spend against that. Because if 250 people are going to be interested in the subject matter that you're going to make, don't spend $10 million on it because you're going to lose your money. Um, spend accordingly. Okay, thanks. Uh, Senator LeBeau. Um, <coughs> thank you, George. First of all, I have to say it's uh, great to be on this panel. Um, and, I, and I love being on a panel with panel where there, it's the first time it's ever happened to me where there's a bar at the end of the panel. I love that. <laughs> um, but there's nothing in my Coke except for Coke. Yeah. Um, this is kind of an insider question about what's happening kind of in, this, in the industry. So I'm, but I'm going to take it from the outsider perspective. And from, my, from the outside, I see all kinds of technological change. But as a state senator, I think what's uh, happened in the last 10 years, last decade, has been a tremendous competition between states to try to grab the um, media and digital film and film industry uh, to come to their states for the very simple reason that we're looking for jobs. Um, and Connecticut has been part of that. And you know, you've seen, you've seen, uh, and I'm intimately involved with the people from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and. Albuquerque Studios, and, and I've read, you know, and we've seen Louisiana and their attempts to, with the tax credits. The tax credits are the real issue here. I'll get back to that later, but, uh, and it's like people in the states competing with each other to, to grab um, a limited market, and so we're bidding up the tax credits from 25% um, in Albuquerque to, I believe it's 30% or, and, and actually, Louisiana has gone up and down. Uh, Michigan went as high as 42 percent. I think they're dropping. Uh, they've dropped back down into Granholm. Um, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania is, 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 in the, is in the business. New York just recently went up, then back down again. Uh, and even California, which is you know, obviously the home of Hollywood, has offered tax credits where before they never did. So that is the, that's a changed landscape for uh, competition for filmmaking and to, to try to get those, and to get you folks in this room, young, smart, intelligent, technologically oriented people to be in their state, to spend your money, to do your, do your art and do your craft and to do the best job you can because that's gonna make our state and the state that grabs those people a better state to live in and a better state uh, economically. Well said. Thank you, well said, thank you. Alec? <clears throat> well, I think I'm going to grab um, the arm and say technology has been the biggest factor uh, in the past decade because what, it, what it's done is it's brought the capability to make films down to a grassroots level where, from what I've seen, a lot of people that hadn't had the opportunity to get involved with the business because the business is pretty much, you know, who you know uh, to get in it. But what's more important is a lot of people out there have stories to tell. So we see a lot of filmmakers blossoming from all over the place because they find different venues to tell their stories. I mean, very common, I think you see it now, is now what's really transferred over is the new common DSLR cameras. They're still cameras, but they're being used to record motion pictures. And the fact is, since they're doing it very well, it gives a lot more people the opportunity 
to become storytellers, which as you can see why we have a filled room here. There's a lot more interest in it. So I think that has really been the basis of the, the change, this drop in technology. And uh, hopefully we'll all be bonding together to be making our own stories in the future. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Alec. Uh, Doug McAward. Okay. <coughs> the, the, the technology advances are obvious. And uh, what used to cost a million dollars for an edit room in 1990 costs about 2200 now. So just be thankful you're not in the big old post-production business uh, like people used to be. But I think I, I agree with Senator LeBeau, aside from the technical end, uh, it's become the competition where 10 years ago, Canada was kicking our ass with getting every television show and movie, and we couldn't do anything as a country, so the states individually took it on. And it was a very difficult thing to figure out, but right now there are 44 states that offer some sort of incentive. And that's amazing that's happened over the last 10 years. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, it just so happens that I think Connecticut's the best. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, some of us spent a long time working on that, and I think it was great that the, uh, the legislature here allowed professionals to help write it. So they knew, because so they, they didn't know our industry, we didn't know theirs, so bringing the two together really helped. Uh, and right now the state of Connecticut has three levels of tax credits for our industry. One is an infrastructure on bricks and mortar and equipment, that's 20%. One is the 30% film tax credit on the shooting. And the third one is, is uh, a new one that just passed this last session, was an angel investor tax credit that actually offers a 25% tax credit against um, uh, startup companies that can work, uh, and that would include c uh, creating content. So they've got all three levels covered, from bricks and mortar production and content here. And we've also got the most comprehensive program versus the other states. So that's one thing we can really be proud of in Connecticut here. Um, that's pretty much my take on, other than the technology, the technology is an obvious one, all these guys covered that. So that's what I want to talk about. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. I think that uh, it would only be appropriate for me to follow up your last comments by reiterating the fact that I am the director of the Connecticut Film Office, and all of the tax credits that Doug was just talking about are availed via my, my office, and our website is ctfilm.com ctfilm.com uh, please log on and check out these uh, incentives for yourselves and if you have any questions whatsoever give us a call send us an email we'll be happy to talk to you about it <clears throat> okay um, Larry what prompted you to uh, to open the shooting gallery I mean, give, talk to folks a little bit about that I, I, I was living in New York when it when it sort of came online or not too long thereafter uh, but I don't know if everyone here in the room knows uh, about TSG. Um, you know, I played college football and the, the NFL didn't call <laughs> when I graduated. <laughs> so <laughs> I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't really uh, thought about doing anything else. Um, and I actually got into this business by accident, to be honest with it. I, I worked in the off seasons in college at an investment bank and at a hospital and at a law firm. and. Um, and you had to put on a suit and shave every day to do those jobs. And then my senior year in college, my roommate's girlfriend said, they're casting this movie um, and they're paying $100 a day and they're looking for criminals, so you should go down. <laughs> um, so me and our nose guard went down to a singing and dancing audition, which we didn't know it was that. She was kind of playing a joke on us. Um, and we actually got it because he was, you know, 6'2", 360, and they were doing sort of dancing stunts off of him, and I guess they felt sorry for me. It was a, a film called Cry Baby with uh, Johnny Depp and Tracy Lords and Patty Hearst, and it was a John Waters film. And uh, I was an extra in a maximum security prison in Maryland called Jessup um, for 10 days, and I was like, people get paid to do this? <laughs> all right, um, I'm going to go home and I'm going to try to get paid to do this. And I didn't know anybody. Um, so I guy I played with, his brother was an assistant location manager in Manhattan. And I went and volunteered for two weeks. Said, you know, if I do a good job, put me on. But I'll, I'll give you two weeks. And um, I was fortunate enough to work literally every day for three years, but nine days. Just pure luck. Just one thing ended, another thing started. So I, I made my union days pretty quickly. And I, I became a, an assistant director. And uh, I was literally, um, cover your ears, I was literally in a, in a bar one night and uh, was complaining with, I was an AD, I was complaining to the line producer about um, 
how stupid our boss was. <laughs> and a uh, guy like three seats down from me is like, why don't you just shut up? You know, it was like two in the morning. I grew up in the Bronx, was in the Bronx, and, and you know, still had some football muscle at that point. And I was like, you know, why don't you shut up? And who are you to tell me this? And the guy's like, I just won an Oscar for my screenplay. We were in the terminal bar under the L on 232nd in the Bronx at 2 in the morning, so I didn't really believe him. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, you're just the guy in the bar talking about your boss. You just, you know, you want to be successful in the entertainment industry. You got to not be that guy, and you got to go do it. And uh, my name is John Patrick Shanley, and I just won an Oscar for Moonstruck. So um, I carded him. I was like, give me driver's license, and it was him. And he's like, look. I'll give you a short story that I wrote. Um, go do it. And uh, this was on Friday. I, I quit on Monday. And that was the last day I ever worked for anybody else. And uh, he was right. I was just the guy in a bar talking. Um, so I took him up on that offer and made a horrible short film that I threw away. <laughs> but it started the process for me. And we were able to get Lily Taylor, who was not famous at the time. And then she got Eric Stoltz, who was famous because they were going out. Um, and we made a real bad film, but I was, you know, had a company and was producing stuff and that led from one thing to another and Hal Hartley called me and said, you know, I got a short, will you do mine? And then I did it and while we were editing that, Nick Gomez was the editor and um, we made a film called Laws of Gravity because we were sitting in my apartment editing a, a film with no money on film <laughs> and uh, some guy knocked on my door with a bag of handguns. I was like, you guys want to buy these? And we're, and we're like, no. And we kind of were talking, what if we did? What if two guys who don't have the wherewithal to sell a bag of guns actually bought it? And that's where the script came out. And um, that film won Berlin and um, sort of launched a three-picture deal with Universal and, 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 and kind of took over like that. Can I just say one thing about the last question, though? And then I'll shut up. Um, how many of you are actually aspiring filmmakers in here. Most of you, right? No offense to anybody. Don't get caught up on this technology conversation. The cost of doing this commercially so that you can make something to sell it is labor. That's why these guys want you here, because it's not the camera, it's not the editing suite, it's the bodies that are required to produce a commercially competitive motion picture anywhere in the world. So it's cool to talk about the red or the, the Canon or whatever, but in a real budget, that you're going to try to be in a movie theater, um, if that's ultimately your goal, um, it's, it's labor. Um, and it's actually the only industry left that we're the global dominant power in. Um, Avatar doesn't come from anywhere else but here. Um, there's not been a crossover film ever that's a global box office performer. So we're still good at this. <laughs> um, and the labor is important. And you know it's a highly skilled highly technically competent group of people who actually do this for a living. That being said, if your ultimate goal isn't the cinema and the multiplex, which statistically is you know, the same as going to the NFL, um, that's where technology comes into play. To make something where you could you know, find a way to monetize it online or on your phones or you know, wherever that is going. So just think about that, that part too. Um, I guess I would like to direct the next question to uh, Senator LeBeau. Um, as co-chair of the Commerce Committee, which is direct cognizance over Connecticut's film production tax credit program, uh, I, as the director of the Office of Film, <laughs> am curious about your thoughts uh, about the use of the program to date and its successes, in your opinion. <coughs> Well, I think the program has been extremely successful. Um, you know, you look at the average age of this room, it's probably 35 or less. Um, you look at the average age of Connecticut, and it's probably 45 or more. Um, precisely the kind of people that we want to be in Connecticut are represented in this room. Um, creative, intelligent, uh, smart people doing creative things. And, uh, you know, and the point that Larry just made about avatar and you know, global dominance, I mean, it's something we can still export. 
it's a, it's a product that we still make in America that can, that can be sold abroad. And no one does it as good as us. And, that's, and, that, and frankly, I'd say it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that we're a democracy, um, probably the closest thing to a true democracy on the earth, um, that we have, we encourage creativity, we encourage people to think, and to think outside the box, and to think about bags of guns coming into your room. <laughs> um, even, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We, we, we're free to think. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with why it's, why we're uh, number one in filmmaking. You know, something that else we were talking before, and it's part of our culture. There's a culture of creativity that um, is very important. And it's not just about films. It's a culture of creativity that creates tomorrow. And from my point of view, as a as the chair of commerce, it's important that we help to create tomorrow, whether it's tomorrow's jet engines, or tomorrow's um, medicines, or tomorrow's techniques in healthcare. And that's where I want to be. That's where I want Connecticut. And you know, I'm going to get corny for a second, but I have a. I came this afternoon from my um, uh, my son turns 21 tomorrow. We're having a little party. And um, I have a daughter who's, I have another son who's 20, 22, will be 23, and a daughter who's uh, 24. So we packed them all together. And uh, my entire life as a legislator, I've been thinking about them and trying to create a future for them. And it's not just, it's not BS, it's real. Because if they don't have a future, we don't have a future. And that's what um, the films have done, is we help to create a new future for the state of Connecticut. So that's... That's a tremendous success. Did I answer your question, George? Yes, sir, you did. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I wanted to cover everything. Well, I, I wanted to wonder if I could give you a, a, a follow-up. In these tough economic times, I mean, what role sort of do you see um, the film and digital media industry specifically playing in potentially econo uh, Connecticut's economic recovery? I, I think it's got an important role. I think it's got an important role. But one of the things that happens in Connecticut, you know, I mentioned your age and the people in the, in the room of a certain age. You know, we, we are the state that loses the most young people. You know, and part of that, you know, part of that people like not Connecticut for that, but part of it is this natural process between New, being, being between New York and Boston. It's going to happen. We've got these two magnets pulling our people, pulling our young people a, a away. But we're going to keep young people here with, you know, with this, uh, with the film and uh, media industry, and I think that's important. Um, I mean, look at Hartford tends to be dead. It's not tonight, not in this room. Um, it's alive, and that's it, it's it's important. I mean, we who wants to come to a you know somebody called uh, Connecticut some years ago, um, the city of the file cabinet city. I mean, how boring. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to be boring. We want to be exciting. We want to be part of of, of what's happening. So I see that's, that's, that's the essential role. I think that's the key role that film and media will play in Connecticut to help provide that life. And I, I don't just look, as you heard me say and as you read my, my um, bio, I don't just look at films as the only industry to do that. There's, there's a variety of industries to do that, but film is one of those industries. And it's something that we've made a priority and we will try to, to continue with. Uh, if I get another question later, I'll maybe go to some of the I difficulties that we're going to have in the future. Yeah, one thing. Two Quick. Seconds. Yeah. The other thing to remember that why I'm, I have no vested interest whatsoever in Connecticut. We need to, to we need to, to bump that direct. up. So I'm speaking <laughs> business and professionally, not because I own nothing here. But what's happened in the last ten years is nobody likes the United States, right? So we, I remember going to the Berlin and Sundance and Cannes and every oh you're American ah now it's like hey you're American whatever and what's happened is all these homegrown industries have sprouted up in Korea in in Russia France has had a mature one but they started you know embargoing all of our stuff and what that's done is made it mandatory to have tax credits or rebate programs because Canada specifically I was a member of the East Coast Council that created the you know, started this whole thing in New York so that the people could work with unions at a, at a reasonable cost. But you can go to Canada and get half your budget, free, half your budget. France, you can get your whole budget. Spain, you can get your whole budget. Korea, you can get your whole, but they'll pay you to make movies. So as business people, we're competing with that. So 
to be blunt, as a financier of films, I'm going to go where the best deal is, whether it's Connecticut or Ohio or Canada or whatever, and that's why everybody left. So we have no choice as a, as a country other than to have tax credit and rebate programs, which is why 44 states have them. What you have to pay attention to in a place like Connecticut is you have winter, right? So Florida doesn't, New Mexico doesn't, California doesn't. So, um, you know, you have to sort of work the program into the fact that there's kind of two or three months where for all intents and purposes, you're closed. Um, However, you there are uh, films that need snow. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and we're here for them. <laughs> and, and look, New York and California's programs will never be competitive with the rest of the states because they have too big of an industry already. Right. So California is a 15 billion dollar industry. You can't give 25 percent back. They don't have the money to do it. Yeah, Same thing with New York. So Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Ohio, everybody's kind of in a good permission position to slice a piece off. You know, so like whenever these guys are promoting it and running for it and talking about it, vote for it. Because if not, nobody's going to come here to be in Connecticut. I will I'll back that up and, and say that I'm not running for office, and, and, uh, but there might be someone sitting at this table who is. And um, yes, take care of those people that are taking care of the industry that you guys want to be a part of. I'll just leave it like that. Um, thanks, Larry. Um, and yeah, our, our culture in America uh, is considered sort of our number one export. Um, and the way you export things is through distribution. And a lot of folks don't know it, but distribution is like ultimately most important. Uh, you can fight to get your film made, but it won't generate any revenue. Uh, people might not even see it, for that matter, if you don't have distribution. And um, I, Doug Schwab um, has distributed, his company has distributed over 500 titles. Um, can you talk to us about how you got into the business and, and sort of your process or, or criteria for selecting the films that you choose to, do, to uh, distribute? Sure. In, in 1997, I started Maverick. And um, before that, I was a buyer for Blockbuster, actually. And uh, I had the data. I knew it would work. I talked to lots of independent filmmakers. And, and I felt that as a Blockbuster representative at the time, I knew it would work because I, I had the proof and the data to back up what would work. So eventually, unlike, you know, pretty much like what Larry said, somebody told me, if you think you know how to do it, go out and do it. So I left, went home one day. The next morning I came in, left Blockbuster and started Maverick back in 97. We started off slow by putting out a handful of films and uh, that was successful. And we built to a maximum of releasing 50, 50 plus films a year. Now we're, we release somewhere around 40 films a year. And just to tell you the sheer number of movies, I can't speak just for Connecticut, but I've recently put out a film made in Connecticut uh, by Neil, who's running the festival called London Betty. And we've got it, you know, wide exposure, digitally, on television, on DVD, Netflix, Redbox, all over. Um, we get about 1,100 movies a year submitted to us in, in Little Deerfield Beach, Florida. 1,100 movies, and when I say movies, a lot of that's loosely based, uh, calling it movies, okay? But sometimes there's loosely based things that can make money and sell, and there's loosely based things that can't make money and sell. And from that, we pick about 50 films a year that, that we release. We, there's, there's always, I never can put my personal taste into what movies we pick, because uh, it would be a totally, I probably wouldn't be in business anymore if it was based on everything that I personally would like. I look at trends, I look at models, I look at what the customers that we sell to are asking for, I look for theatrical successes. If, there's, if action is in vogue, we, we, we put on an action hat. If Christian movies are in vogue, we, we put on a Christian hat. We, we don't really uh, try to go a buck the system, so to speak, but what we do look for in the films we put out is good quality, a beginning, a middle, and end, a good story, and what we take a lot of pride in is, is the packaging because the packaging is so important in an independent film. Where Larry at Shooting Gallery would make big films with big stars and people were driven to it, our, our identity is by creating the key art, by creating the image that somebody will pick that cover up or now click that button and download the movie. And we feel that it's gonna be the same taste as they were before, but um, now we just have to socially 
market to those people to find where the movies are in cyberspace as opposed to finding them on your nearest blockbuster new release wall? You know, speaking about cyberspace and, and distribution specifically, um, I know you've, you've, you've recently started a new company, Maverick Global. Um, can you talk about some of the, the differences that you encounter uh, in various marketing the films in various mar markets, say foreign versus domestic? What Maverick Global is essentially is a, um, it's just like Maverick domestically, except we set up at Cannes, at AFM, at MIP, and different markets around the world, and we sell the films to international buyers like me. So I'm an independent here in the U.S., you know, a Maverick based in Deerfield Beach, Florida. There's a Maverick company in Greece, and there's a Maverick in Russia, and there's a Maverick type company in China and Japan, and we meet with, the, with those people. And, and to everybody's point earlier to say that America does uh, the independent film and the mainstream film business the best, that is totally true, because when we can show them a cover, and we can show them that this was placed at Walmart or Blockbuster or Netflix, that's what they're interested in, even in countries like Bulgaria and so forth. So although the tastes are quite different in every country, and maybe there's a genre that sells better in France than, than it sells here domestically, we, we pretty much treat it the same way. If we're catering to an, an upscale, affluent buyer, we show them what would appeal to them. If we're catering to a buyer that likes testosterone-based action films, we show them what would work for them out of draw B. So we know that everything doesn't work for everybody, and that's, that's how we start. Much. Um, we're moving a little fast because people are t going to tell me to stop short, shortly. But, so I wanted to talk to you, Alec, really quickly, or at least um, you've been involved in film industry and academia in these parts of New England for quite some time. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk to us um, about the Southeastern Connecticut filmmakers, uh, also known as Sect Film, if any of you are, are out there, how it's doing and in, in, in sort of why uh, you brought it into being. Well, um, Sec Film was created about, um, about two years ago, and uh, we formed it in New London uh, because, I'm, believe it or not, I'm not from Connecticut. I live in Rhode Island, but I only sleep there. I work, live, and play here in Connecticut. And um, that's right, that's right. Take care of you guys anyway. But seriously, we started the, the organization two years ago because we, sat, we found this technology was coming out and becoming more rampant that people had the availability to grab these cameras and make these little movies. They were editing them on their final cut pros at home. And then they were like, but they really did them poorly. They didn't really understand the dynamics of what it takes to tell a story. So I had been in the industry for a number of years, came back to the East Coast because I love New England. And so after working at Solace for a couple of years, decided to, uh, to kind of reach out to people and just help them learn and educate them. So Southeastern Connecticut uh, Filmmakers was an organization that really grew as about 12 filmmakers that decided, hey, look, let's get together and make some films. And we did. We just did short films. Now there's 200 members in our group. So we're pretty strong. We're actually all over New England now. Um, so we're expanding. And it's good because what we're doing is we're training people. We, I bring in people that I work with in the industry because I do work professionally as a director doing music videos and commercials. But I bring people in that I work with the industry to help train them. So it's not necessarily a film school. It's education beyond that. And I'll tell you the one thing that has been the beneficial piece about Connecticut was this film industry training program that was started here because a lot of people maybe some of you in the room actually became members of that and took advantage of that because it was a fantastic program that started up but then a lot of these people that have taken the program haven't had a place to work what we've done is we've kind of brought them into our fold and we've worked on these short films and and they learn from experience you learn as you go you know as Larry said you got to jump in you got to move but it's up to you to make that decision so this organization that we formed, we have a table actually set up over there. So if you're interested, go over there and take a look at the films and talk to some of the members there to learn more about it. But we're growing and we're realizing that it's not at the point to put somebody towards, if, they're, if their final goal is to be the feature film director and to be that filmmaker that makes big budget films, well, you know what? You're only gonna get there through trial and error and you're gonna make mistakes. So what we're doing is we're creating this organization so people can make those mistakes. <clears throat> Outstanding. Thank you very much, Alec. I, we're moving kind of quickly here, and you were talking about the sect that has 200 members. I didn't know that. I guess you and I should talk some more. Um, <laughs> but 
that's a good thing. Um, and I, I, to, to sort of turn the table now to you, uh, Doug McAward, um, there's 200 members just in SEC Film out there, um, and I know that you're involved with uh, an emerging production facility uh, known as, I think, Dog Star uh, Studios down in Stratford. Can you talk about that a little bit and, and, and tell us what types of productions you're targeting as clientele and where some of these folks that are in SEC Film and graduates from the film industry training program might hopefully be able to show off their skills? Okay. Well, based on the legislation that we got passed, that we wrote and got passed a couple of years ago, and all of the infrastructure ones that came in on top of that, it gave us an opportunity to start a new business in Connecticut, and we've found a, a, a building in uh, Stratford that's got 292,000 square feet, and we've already designed out 12 sound stages within it. Uh, we're going to be getting the keys for it in a couple of weeks. We've already got all our permits. We've got our architectural work done. Everything's ready to go. We're about to get the keys in a couple of weeks. It'll be a few months of build out and then we're going to open up for everything from large productions to small productions. We've got a uh, uh, 14,000 foot stage all the way down to 875 square feet. Um, we have a, a, we're starting an academy in there called the Dog Star Academy uh, training program for people, uh, everything from television to film, because we also own two low power television licenses, Channel 51 in New Haven and Channel 22 in Danbury. We're going to be produce. We got two two studios in there dedicated to that, and we're, and we're going to have our act our students in our school actually run the television station and put their own programming on it. We'll be the only tra school in the country that actually has two live television stations for the people to learn how to run a TV station. And it's not just going to be on the technical side; it's also going to be the business side of television. Uh, we're we've got a, we we've got about 150,000 square feet of the building already committed to outside tenants. Uh, we've got a set shop. We've got mutual hardware coming up from New York. We've also just got the, uh, made a deal with a company in Los Angeles, um, a New Deal Studios. They're going to take about 30,000 square feet, and they're bringing six smaller companies with them, all to take advantage of the tax credit programs here. They just did the effects for Inception. So they want to have an East Coast operation. They're going to set up shop in our place. So we're going to have everything from, from, from low budget to high budget. We've already got, uh, we've had the unions up to discuss how they're going to be involved with us. They're also going to be working with us in the training program because IA just started a, a, an industry training program in New York City, and we're going to mirror that one here, and they've already agreed to uh, participate with that with us up here. So we're trying to cover all of the bases. Um, and like I said, in a few, we'll be getting the keys in a few weeks. There'll be some announcements, and then uh, we're going to open up one studio at a time. We've already got two that we've got a, the design to do first. But actually, we already have this. The day we get the keys, we got a 12-day shoot starting for a low-budget movie. They want to come in. They need a warehouse empty. They're just going to fill it with garbage, shoot Perfect. the movie, and get out. So <laughs> the day we get the keys, somebody's going to shoot for 12 days, and they're ready. Uh, once they're done, we'll be able to get the back of the place filled out. But um, that's, that's, that's what... Uh, that's a, that's a result of the tax credit legislation because it gave us an infrastructure. The investors like the infrastructure tax credit. Um, the production tax credit goes without saying for the work we bring in. And also now with the, in, the uh, um, angel investor tax credit, we've got a way to actually start, in, to start new companies that can create content and get a, an additional tax credit on that. So Connecticut's got all the bases covered right now and we're, we're working to get this thing up and running so that by the time the legislature opens up again next, January, we can showcase it and make sure everybody sees the, the results. Our goal with the legislature is to, is to convince them to actually give some long-term serious study done on these credits to see how effective they are. Because every year there's somebody who wants to tweak them, remove them, or get rid of them. We need a couple of years to prove it, how it's working, come back with a real good solid study, and once they realize how many jobs are created and how much new money has been brought to the, to the, to the state, no one will touch them. They'll just know that it works. As long as these things pay for themselves, we shouldn't get rid of them. I mean, the first person to say get rid of them if, if, if we lose money on it. But so far, we haven't. They, they brought about $800 million worth of new business to the state. And all Where we can do is go from there. From? You guys. That's right. <laughs> yes, that keeps changing. These guys keep track. They do the best they well, can, the but there's no keeps system. It's getting bigger. Yeah. But, but uh, it's interesting that you should, you should mention that. And, uh, the, you know, the reason that's 
all this activity is happening here and, and uh, a big interest behind this gathering right now is because of the tax credits. And again, um, the, the uh, Committee of Cognizance with regard to the tax credits would be Senator LeBeau's committee. And I, I, I wanted to, to uh, open it back up to Senator LeBeau uh, to sort of address um, sort of his uh, captaining, so to speak, of of the legislation that we have and, and, and the opportunities that might um, be available uh, in the future uh, to further refine the legislation or uh, what have you. George, I think the most important thing in the future is to hold the tax credits the way they are. I mean, I think we've got a good program and it's working, but that is not universally accepted in the legislature, nor is it universally accepted by a, a set of studies that have been done. Uh, Voices for Children, which is a, a kind of a liberal think tank, has come out against the, the essentially against the tax credits. Um, the federal, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, United States, uh, the Northeast piece of that has, uh, for out of Boston, has had a, had a negative report. And it, one of the problems that we have is that the current, and this George has nothing to do with this, and. I want to separate him out from this, but we have a uh, DECD, which Department of Economic and Community Development, which is supposed to have a report back to the legislature last January, and it is uh, we're late in August, and that report on the film industry has not been produced yet. It's a travesty that that has not been done, and we need to see that data. Um, let me let me give you a context, folks. Uh, next year, we, we have about a $19 billion budget in the state of Connecticut. We are looking at at least a $3.5 billion hole in that budget. That's a, that, and, and over the next two years, $7 billion on $38 billion, that's, that's a close to 20% hole. Now, this program is costing us 100 to $150 million in the data that I've seen. Um, there are people who say, let's shut that down. We can get those dollars back. And the question becomes, okay, well, what's coming back? The, the, you know, Doug, you just hit the nail on the head. Does it work? Does it work? And I have data, and I've supported this program continually because the data that I have shows that, particularly if we build bricks and mortar facilities like you have, uh, like is planned in Windsor, like is, like is planned in South Windsor, um, a Blue Sky Studios, if we have those, those bricks and mortar facilities, sign a list, if we have those bricks and mortar facilities, we'll tend to, we will tend to get a dollar back on our dollar. Look, at, I don't care if we break even, but we can't lose money. You can't lose money. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a business proposition for the state of Connecticut. If we're putting a dollar out in a tax credit, we want a dollar back in terms of what we're getting back uh, on taxes through direct and indirect multiplier effects. It's, that's what it's about. It's a business, and it's a business for us. To have the economic activity is a great thing for all the reasons I mentioned earlier about the, the kind of people that are involved in this. But if we're losing money, we're gonna, it's not going to last. Now, we're really new in this program. I mean, it's really three years in, and we should not come to conclusions. But we have to monitor it very carefully. And I'm going to tell you, there's going to be tremendous, tremendous pressure next year to have cuts in this program. Um, I had to fight all this year. I'm talking once a week I had a meeting where I had to say to leadership of the Senate and the House, you can't cut this program because it's working. There are studios being built. And we are going to be a winner in this. I've got to see that. I've got to see that data. We've got to prove it. And that's absolutely important. Because if we're losing money, it's not going to last. And that, becomes, and that becomes an issue with us and other states, too. And, and I mentioned in my opening remarks that some states have gone up and down. They've, they've changed the credit. Um, if we do make changes, we have to have you folks at the table and talk about what those changes are going to be and to keep, to keep a, a viable film industry in Connecticut. Um, so those are, those are the issues we face, George. Um, uh, we, I, I certainly, I'm very happy that you're sitting on, on, on this panel, Senator, and I'm glad that you're telling people to straight skinny. Um, and I do believe, as you do, that the, the, to date, 
the 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 program is working we're seeing a lot of investment we we've got um for instance three uh talk shows have relocated to stanford uh, nbc universal has invested heavily in uh studios there we've got the jerry springer show we've got maury povich we've got steve wilkos i could go on and we're seeing a lot of critical mass being built behind the incentives in terms of building this industry and it's very important that we as uh, Senator Lobo just said that we hold what we've got and we build on that and it's also important that you guys know who's in there doing what to help this industry maintain itself here and this is one of those individuals and make your voice heard uh, make your voice heard with myself make your voice heard more importantly with your legislators you can all go online to ct.gov and figure out wherever you live who your respective legislator is and get in touch with that individual and let them know how important this is to your livelihood and to the state's economic recovery. Um, Let's go one quick thing to wait a minute, man, I'm preaching. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, just for one quick, quick comment on that. Uh, it's the investors that get spooked when they don't see stability in these tax credits. And a, a movie's gonna come in and go out and when we get rid of them, they're going to go to Ohio in and out. They're going to go to Bulgaria in and out. But in order to get the, the bricks and mortar built here, the investors have to see stability and a long-term commitment from the legislature. And I don't blame them for, for being sketchy on this, job, but we just got to, get, we got to come up with a really good tracking system to prove they work. Then there'll be no reason to get rid of them. And that'll make the investors more comfortable to put more money into the bricks and mortar because they don't want to see these things disappear. And like I said, they actually, you know, the, the, the companies that come in and go out, they really don't care because they'll always find another state or another country to pull their production off in. So that's why that's that's my last word on the on the credits. Uh, you know, a good idea. What do you put in the industry that hasn't been put in the Should I answer? Please. Um, I think that's absolutely the future. Um, you ever heard of the Guild? Yeah, I have. Okay. Do you know the story about the Guild? So woman's in Hollywood trying to get her sitcom bought by the networks, no takers, nobody knows who she is, she's unrepresented. You know, clever concept, um, not the greatest thing you've ever seen, but well made and, and clever, decides to, you know what, I'm gonna go find competent actors and a competent crew and I'm gonna make 10 minute webisodes of my series called The Guild, which takes place in the world of Warcraft. And briefly the concept is, you know, this sort of pretty neurotic woman um, is like this heroine in her in, in this game. I don't play it, but in this game, you're like you're somebody else. Like you have an avatar, right? And some guy in her guild is a hacker, and he finds her because they're together in the guild. So he thinks they're together in real life, and he shows up like, "Hey, how you doing? We're married now, right?" And so she enlists the other members of the guild to help her um, fight it. So it's a comedy, sort of sitcom-based comedy. Again, well, well written, well acted, the whole thing. But she picked a niche that she knew she could market to, which is the most important thing that you should take f from this whole thing is know who your audience is and know who you're marketing to, okay? World of Warcraft, pretty 10 million people, militant about it, super enthusiastic about it. She starts marketing to them. After three or four episodes in her first season, she runs out of money. She's making these things for like 10 or 15 grand. And she puts up on her website, if you'd like to see more of these, here's my PayPal account and they funded it. People putting up $10, $50, 100 I think for 1000 you could get a credit, whatever, but people wanted to see more of her kind of content. She is currently has a seven-figure, multi-million dollar deal with Microsoft and Sprint. She has two million unique visitors a month, and she doesn't return the network's phone calls now because <laughs> she doesn't need to because she has her own audience and her own advertisers. So again, this is a very closed system. If any of you are to send your scripts to Warner Brothers, Universal, or NBC, they will not be opened. They will be sent back to you. Somebody came up to me in the beginning, can I send you my headshot? You know where those headshots go? Right in the garbage. Actually, we recycle them. But y your random headshot coming in our mailbox, like what do you really think we do with it? Y you know, because you know how many we get? It's just thousands and thousands and thousands that are undecipherable office too we yeah <laughs> so the the tech sort of tying everything together today the technology and that's where the opportunity is because you can make your own audience for your stuff and again you don't need to spend millions of dollars you don't need a guy like me like 
my money comes with strings. I, I raised $250 million from outside the United States. Like, I got to pay it back. <laughs> like, end of discussion. Got to pay it back. I can't lose it. Just like he can't lose, I can't lose. So I'm going to look to him to make sure the legislation works because if I get this, that's 25 tickets I don't have to sell. So we're going to be all over you <laughs> to make the money. And, and we know how to do this better than you in a commercial world, right? Because we've done it 100 times. We're not going to listen to you. You're not going to tell us what to do. You're not going to be the auteur. We're going to insist that you have movie stars and all the elements we need to make it valuable. But you don't need me on the web. Absolutely. You need to make it, and you need to market it well. Incredibly, she marketed it impeccably, impeccably. Very, very good, uh, very good, good counsel. Uh, well, they're they're kicking us out, dude. So. <laughs> and it was said earlier is that to be a filmmaker, you really have to know how to market your film. So you really got to think about that first. And everything like I said, it's all about your audience, finding your audience. But the web is such an incredible tool. That's the way to get your information out to people. Because that's the information that you're going to want to take to a distributor to show them, look at what I have. Look at what I've built behind me. So right now, technology involves that whole thing with the web. Use it. The most valuable thing you have on your side is time. So use your time to market your material before you even go out and, and shoot it. Figure out who your audience is and market it to them and gr make your audience grow. All right. I'm sorry that, uh, that we have to cut it off at, at this point, um, but I would like to just say once again uh, a, a, a sincere thanks to the folks at uh, the Film Industry Mixer for having us all come here and comprise this panel, and I would appreciate it if you would give up a collective round of applause for our panelists.